you. Uh, we were uh, we've been talking about uh, class division in uh, sports, and uh, that sport is uh, also some sports is also layered on like on the social stratifications. Um, we are going to continue with more research on who does sports in Norway. And then we're using a report from 2012 about physical activity and social indifference or unequal inequality. Now the main points in this report is that the number of active Norwegians have increased. We know that. What do we call what do we call the period from 1965 to 1985 in Norwegian sports? This is a quiz question. What was the um, characteristic of that period, 1965 to 85? Sports revolution, we call it. And this is continuing from 1985 to 2009. It's not right to say that it stopped in 1985. The number of active Norwegians are still increasing. Uh, more women and elderly are active than they used to be. They're more active than they used to be. We saw that more or in if about 40% is women. Uh, adult l women are more active than adult men. But on general terms, more, m more or male are more active than female. And um, from the age of 15, we have a big, um, I don't know if we could all call it a problem. NIF would consider it a problem. Uh, but the number of uh, active in NIF decreases and there is a big dropout rate. So people stop doing sports around the age of 15. Not everyone, but many. Yeah? Uh, do you know uh, if there are more girls than uh, guys? Or that drops out? Mm, I'm not sure, actually. Uh, but I would assume that there are a bit more girls than, than boys. We would be able to look at this. We don't have a statistics here, but we would, if you see the, stati the statistics of girls and boys, and if you would see whether or not, what is happening. We can try to find that af uh, out afterwards. But I'm not quite sure what's the numbers. But I would, as I said, assume that there is a slightly more girls dropping out than boys. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So who are the most active? As we've already stated a few times, the level of physical activity increases with education and income. So the people with most education and the highest income are most active, physically active. And this is kind of um, um, run <laughs> running in the family, or this is um, affecting also the children. So children of highly active or educated people with high salaries are more active than people with less income and less education. That is not very uh, strange, maybe, when we know that the activity is often uh, going hiking and uh, skiing, etc., etc. This is something that you bring your children to do. And we see also that uh, um, very often uh, children reports to be active during the week but in the weekends, they are, you see the division a lot more. Uh, so in the weekends, when the parents are responsible for the activity, you can, uh, you can see the difference of the ones that are active and not so active. Uh, people in large municipalities and cities uh, with service sector or tertiary industry are most active. And they are more active than uh, people in in the municipalities that are smaller with more uh, primary industry. 
And that, of course, have to do with the same as this. The income level is higher in those municipalities as well. And also um, in urban areas, and particularly around the capital, people are more active than in the district. Why do you think that is? Why are people more active in urban areas than in the district? If we say district not being uh, Molde, but the district being um, more uh, what we term Bigda, outside. Why are they more active in the urban rather than rural areas? Anyone from uh, the rural areas here? Yeah? Are, uh, are people active in your community? Yeah? People are active in, the, in those communities too. Uh, but um, but uh, slightly less than in the urban areas. I would think maybe because you can see there are huge differences, of course, in the urban areas. There are some people that are not active at all, and then there are some people that are active. I could, for instance, think that if I was assuming why this is, maybe, um, maybe the opportunities are less in the rural areas. Yeah, Maris? Yeah, you have a lot more options. Yeah. I remember that it's many years ago now, but there was uh, this <laughs> headline in the newspaper, local, new uh, not local, Vega, uh, which is like main new newspaper in Norway, uh, about two girls, and they grew up in a in an island in the north called Dunna. <laughs> uh, I have never been there, but it's uh, apparently it's a s quite small island. Is it in Trøndelag? Nulan maybe? Uh, anyway, these girls, they, had, they ran away from home. Um, because uh, it was so boring in Dunna. So they just had to escape. I think maybe they, be, they were, um, they were um, inspired by a movie that was very popular like 20 years ago. You probably didn't see it because you weren't born, but <laughs> it's called fucking Omol, <laughs> which is a Swedish classic film. And these girls, they were, it was so boring, so they just had to do something. Anyway, these girls, and they were interviewed when they were found, and they were to <laughs> returned to their uh, island, Dörna. And so, so wha what was it that kept you running from home? They were like 14, 15. No, it was so boring. There were two things you could do in Dörna. Either you could play football, or you can play in the um, in the corps, uh, band, marching the marching band in school. So you could either play football or being in a marching band. If you didn't like neither of them, you would go there anyway just to listen because there was nothing else to do. This is before the internet and before all those things. And that's, I think it's uh, probably an extreme example, but it's, it's actually in the rural areas, this is sometimes the reality. Either you play football, because that's what they do, or you're in the marching band, because that's the second thing you do. And if you don't like any of those, you're not active. And uh, particularly uh, with the internet age, as we can call it now, this is even a, probably even a bigger problem. Kurserpa. Kurserpa. Hmm? <laughs> Tør ikke å si det? For alle andre også ser på, så det var litt sånn. Satt på pause, du. Nå er det så etterpå. Hva er meningen? Ok, anyway, we see clear patterns of higher class dominance in many sports in Norway. This is higher class, green lower class uh, blue and we see that on average all these activities this is um, hiking skiing being in the gym strength training that is actually more people from the lower class that is doing cycling to work higher class hiking in the mountain this is hiking in the woods jogging and cycling as training or exercise 
So we see there is a dominance of higher class dominance. We're not saying that high class is like, I don't know, um, it's not uh, aristocracy, <laughs> you know, it's just people with high income and high education, okay? Um, we see in uh, sports such as cross-country skiing, there's a high dominance of higher class. Slalom, not strange because ex equipment is expensive. This is running, more or less equal. Swimming isn't that divided after all. It's more n normal people <laughs> are low. Gymnastics, pretty much equal. Football, that's the other way around. More people from the lower class or lower... I, I don't like using the word class because we don't really use that in Norway, but you know what I mean. Uh, weightlifting, same, dancing. So there is this uh, quite um, <coughs> evident divide here. And these, these sports are obviously cheaper. Of course you have to pay to be in the gym, but it's obviously cheaper than slalom. Not running, but cross-country skiing, etc. Cross-country skiing is in some uh, <laughs> environments or in some uh, social environments, milieu, that's high status um, sports. So why are people active? More men than women say that having fun, experience social fellowship and competing is important. But women scores higher than men on all other motives, including equality, no, equ not equality, but quality of life and instrumental motives such as health and um, physical appearance and those kind of things. But it's different. Young people, of course, of course, young people in their teenagers, teens and twenties, uh, they are more, uh, um, they are uh, the instrumental, uh, the appearance, uh, being nice, showing off. It's more important that for people that is older, uh, which has more the health argument for being active. And obviously, if you are an athlete, the whole um, uh, injury aspect is also very important. You can see it yourself. High score and quality in life and health, higher social classes, lower joy, excitement and self-realization. So many motives are the same. Some motives change and then are some that are more evident in other, for some than others. So why do, don't you do sports? This is general. Uh, this is, uh, means that this is very important part of the explanation why they don't do sports takes too much time, injury, tiring, too expensive, boring, uh, doesn't the hours or the time of the practice doesn't fit me, lack of good environment, it's difficult to get to, bad equipment or lack of equipment, lack of good instructors or lot or a or lot or tough competition. So, but main basically it's the time argument that, say, uh, that is peop people are using for not doing sports. Um, and also the, the personal situation. If you, if you have a, like a, um, a category in itself, the personal situation is also scoring high rather than, um, um, yeah, rather than equipment. Women, uh, women is experiences higher barriers for being physically active rather than men, and maybe even uh, or mostly on the, on the time. Women that are in the 30s, 40s, need to juggle work, home, of course, everybody's, or not everybody, <laughs> many are too uh, with their children, etc. But uh, studies show that women take most of um, 
maybe they don't take most of the responsibility, but they feel that they do, or they feel that it's more their responsibility. So that actual time, um, uh, time, uh, what do you say, stolpen, <laughs> is I think it's very relevant for women in the 30s and 40s with small children. You can see that personal situation is scoring a bit higher for the ones with a low uh, status or a low class. Has to do with um, money, etc. Organization and equipment. So there is there are differences. Uh, we want we will skip this because now we're entering a different topic, which is integration. Did any of you write about that in your uh, class in your? Um, in your uh, coursework, social integration, racism, uh, or uh, integration, no? Because sports and NIF is, uh, is um, very aware and um, if not aware, at least um, belie they believe in this sport as a social um, integration arena and sport as a way to include people of various, various, um, in various situations. And there are many reasons why they consider sport as a good tool. First of all, um, sport has, there's a structural reason. Sport is uh, the same for everyone. If you participate in handball, you have to, uh, you have the same rules to buy to as anyone else on the team. So it's easy. There, it doesn't make any difference on anyone. The structures are the same. And it requires more or less the same. Um, many people say, talk about the universal language of sport. And of course it's easy to maybe criticize that too. But there is some correctness in that. That there is, you have the same kind of, the same rules that apply, uh, which makes it easy to, uh, to play together. And uh, sports get, or a NIF, for instance, get a lot of money for um, their integration work from the government because they believe in sport as a tool. It also has a cultural function. Uh, the same values and the same norms apply to everyone on the sporting field. You can come from different backgrounds, obviously, but you need to relate to the same set of, of norms. Okay, here it's fair play. That's you have to, it's the same, in, in the same pattern is here, but it's also more, it's deeper than just rules that you have to, you only have three steps, for instance, in Hamburg or whatever. Mm. And then is the argument that this is social. You experience friendship through sports. And that's why governments are willing to support sports. You can't see this. Meeting place across borders. There are high expectations. <coughs> but the question is, of course, is this correct? Is this how it is in reality? Okay, we have all these nice words about sport and its integration fact or um, possibilities. But is this happening in real life? Do you have any experiences yourself from your own sports where sport has been used as an integration arena with success? How is that in French sport? And I'm just throwing a... a <laughs> I think it's interesting to look at the differences because we're not that far away from each other. But still, we know that uh, France has um, a higher um, higher amount or a higher number of immigrants than we do. And we also hear about uh, riots and problems, etc., uh, causing or coming from this desperation or frustration or whatever. Uh, in society, but do you have any like examples on on uh, well integration 
platforms for sport in in France? No. Is it divided? Hmm? The French yeah, that is obviously a good example. But in um, if you take more of um. No, I I, I won't <laughs> I I won't push it anymore. But um, yeah, okay. In Norway, we uh, we see this um, anyway. The statistics that show that um, minority youth, in particular, are less active in organized sport, are less active in NIF. Um, there are 42% um, of the majority girls that are active in NIF, and only 16% of the minority girls. That's less than half. And also, minority boys are more active than minority girls in NIF. Okay, this is organized sport in Norway. It's not sport for such. Uh, so there are more minority boys that are active in sports than the girls. And particularly, uh, girls with Muslim uh, background. And... Um, these are drawn to unorganized sport. So it's not like they're not doing sports, but they're not in NIF. And uh, now research has looked at why this is. Why is this? That the girls are not included, or because attempts are done to include girls in sports. And we always hear success stories. There are many stories about minority girls that, are, that are, have had success in Norwegian sports. So it's not like either or, which is it, it's not like that in, in France either. But there is this tendency. And then, of course, both NIF and also as researchers, we need to f try to find out why this is in order uh, for some changes to be made. Now, the bottom line is, is sport the great integration arena that they say it is through NIF? Not sports as such, but sport through NIF. Is that the ideal integration arena for everyone? Yes, minority boys are active. We know we, we've got plenty of examples and we see that, I don't know how it is in Molde on the, on the football teams here, on like children level, uh, but we see that in Oslo, for instance, uh, there's lots of integration projects and in some parts of the city it's um, uh, it's not a problem, and, uh, or not a problem. It's very, it's very, uh, they're very active. But the girls, they don't participate that much. And um, a researcher called Kristin Walset, she has looked at these reasons. Why are they less um, participate, or less uh, active in organized sport? What is it? Um, and she uses, um, because it's obvious that it's easy to draw conclusions based on know-how. We know, oh no, this is probably that, oh no, they're not allowed. They can't swim because they're not allowed to wear a swim, swimming suit. So they can't, for instance, not swim, Muslim girls. Uh, they're not allowed to, to run unless they, um, wear a, a hijab and, um, and the rules of uh, that specific sport doesn't allow that. So that's why they don't, you know, we use this because we, we think we know, but there, there need to be research on the basis of this. Why is this? In order to change something. Uh, and uh, Valset, she uses the word intersectionality, which means that there's not only one reason, there's not only one easy explanation on things. You need to look at different perspectives and see how these influences each other and crosses each other to actually def uh, to actually um, not only define but to um, to um, recognize if there if it is a problem mm. so she's been looking at social networks she's been looking at young Muslim, Muslim women that does sport and that does not sport. And she looks at why it is that they are less active in sport than other 
majority girls and also minority boys. And also, uh, one of the things that uh, the reason why she found or uh, she did this is also in order to change something, in order for NIF to change something, start, start to make changes in the system, you need to know why and what it is that should be or could be changed. And then maybe stop talking about there's one, one way and there's one ideal way of uh, integration when those little things aren't in place. Anyway, uh, she argues that the reality is complex. There are many reasons why, why, um, why girls, minority girls, are less active. And it's not only that they're not allowed, which many people think, and that the religion sets boundaries for them. Um, she uses the word body culture, which is, uh, which is, um, religion would be part of this. And she says that culture, the, your cultural background and your religion is kind of, um, we say internalized, internalized, you understand that word? You, you adapt your, it's kind of, you made it your own. So it's not necessarily that you're not allowed from your parents, but you don't want to. You don't have, um, you ha it's, to not uh, participate is your own choice. You don't do it because you don't feel it fits you in some, in some way. And there are many reasons why it doesn't fit you, but it's not like you're forced to. Of course, there will be people that are forced not to. Uh, we must not generalize and say that everybody is the one thing or the other. But mostly what she found is that, that the girls, it's, it's their own choices often. Uh, but culture is by far not the most important reason. And, and that's the reason why, uh, which is always uh, or very often put across if we discuss this. Oh no, it's the culture, it's the religion. And then it's so easy because you can just say that that's how it is. And if it's a religious question, we can't do anything about it. And if it's a cultural question, we can't do anything about it. But that's not the main reason she found. Resources was the main reason, or one of the main reasons. And that is also in relation to what we're talking about. Money. It's expensive to do sports. There was an example from her article of a girl who were playing, I don't remember if it was football or basketball. But when you play sports in Norway, you are required to do voluntary work, yeah? Uh, and playing sports, okay, you pay the fee to go to, uh, to play, to practice, and then you have games. Most clubs provide jerseys, etc. so you don't have to pay for your own jerseys. That's quite uh, good, and also balls, etc. If you play basketball, they usually have balls in the club, at least they used to. But then if you're going to games, you have to pay to get to games. And if you live in Oslo, of course, sometimes it's just one or two stops with the subway. And you have a subway card anyway, so it doesn't matter. But other, other times you will have to drive. And then parents are expected to drive. And also any parent are expected to drive. Also the ones that don't have a car are expected to drive. So one girl, she said, that, yes, but we didn't have a car. So when it was our turn to, to drive, my father had to rent a car to drive to the game. And of course, her father couldn't rent a car every time he had to drive to the game. It's too expensive. So this was the main reason or a main hindrance in doing sports. And I think this is a very good example of what we've been discussing now to, to both today and last time. This whole social gap that is created in sport because of those little things. You have to pay to go to games. You have to pay to go to a tournament. You don't have money and it's easier to say, no, I don't like football anymore, than to say that we can't afford to go. That is, for some people, embarrassing. You don't want to say that. So resources was one of the main issues for these girls not to participate. Uh, and it is obviously a mechanism which excludes excludes from sport and this is both minority 
and majority youth and children and youth. And as I said many times now, this is a serious problem for sport and they're taking it seriously now. But it's something that needs to be even more emphasized because it's, uh, it's bad if this is the reason. And then <coughs> they pointed to the logics that they call the logics of sport. What is the logics of sport? What do we, what do we teach people in sports, basically? Anyone? Or what is like the, the logics of sports? You understand that? At least in, uh, from the outside, on the, from the outset, what do you focus on in sports? We know that when we've, do, we've done sports, uh, I mean, sports is great as a, it, uh, as a social thing. I like to stay fit and, um, yeah, yeah, and that is very important. Because that, I would say, from the outset, that might be the strongest logic, this competition. And for some people, this competing, the idea of competing, doesn't appeal to you. And many of the girls in her study uh, claim that this is, not, this is not what I want. I don't want to come there to compete with others. Uh, it was more appealing, maybe, to the boys than to the girls. But the girls, the minority girls, claim that this is not what I'm after. Um, so the whole logic of sport doesn't appeal to me. I don't want to do it. Uh, and then it's a very important finding from her, is that on, the, on outside sport, because we're always talking about in sports, because that's where we can count. We can count how many memberships we have in NIF, right? But outside sports, the minority girls are just as active as the majority girls when it comes to working out on their own. So it's not like they're lazy or not allowed or the religion says, oh, don't be physically active. Maybe even quite the contrary. Be physically active. Take care of your body. You're supposed to do that. But not the organized set, setup that we have in Norway doesn't necessarily appeal to this group. And this logic doesn't fit everyone. So her um, main conclusions in this order and with this um, kind of um, increasing font, first of all, sport should just stop the nonsense, just accept religious clothing. If religion is a reason which we was she shown that it's not the main reason, but if it's one reason not to be active, it shouldn't be a question. Just allow it, doesn't matter. If it, if it includes more people, if you don't feel excluded, there's no reason why NIF shouldn't ac uh, accept religious clothing. And I know that many, many um, uh, federations internationally has now started to to accept more and more religious clothing, or not necessarily religious clothing either, but less, less <laughs> naked clothing. For instance, uh, if, you are, um, if you're playing volleyball, you can play with long, long tights. Used to be very, very uh, strict measures. Should be 30 centimeters above the knee, not less, you will be fined, etc., etc. And also, many other sports, you will find more and more uh, acceptance for religious clothing. Um, that's one of her suggestions. The other one is to organize or adapt sport for minority girls to fit their culture and religious codes, if this is an issue. If it is an issue, and, and the same will be if, if any of you are going to work as um, physical education teachers. Any of you thinking about that? Possibly? Uh, you're most likely, unless you work in a very um, homogene group, but you're most likely to experience challenges when it comes to, for instance, swimming, which is not a problem in Molde because we don't have a swimming pool <laughs> for everyone, but uh, people that can't uh, shower, for instance, with others b because of their religious convictions. Um, and then one one um, 
maybe not as a, as a physical education teacher, but one, one thing you, that can be done is to, to adapt sports, such as this. This is a couple of years ago. I remember when I showed this last year, they were very uh, critical. They shouldn't be done, shouldn't be done. They should learn to be in Norway when they're in Norway, etc. But this is a gym uh, where men are not allowed in uh, for a little while at least. They feel more comfortable here. You don't have to train with uh, religious clothing. Um, maybe this is the way to go in Norwegian sports too. Uh, maybe we should make uh, or create meeting places for people that need, need it, more or less. So this is one way to go. The other thing she says, the sports logic is competition. NIF need to emphasize sport for all, which is their ideal. Sport for all is the ideal of NIF. So this, of course, in NIF, this is internalized. We, we want sport for all. But on the outset, not everybody sees this. Somebody sees NIF equals competition, equals talent identification, equals specialization, etc., 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 burnout, dropout, whatever. But NIF should, more than that, show that they are providing an opportunity to actually improve your health and this sport for all. That should be NIF's logic. It's interesting to see that gyms, local or private, privatized gyms, are more and, and more and more appealing to more people. When people quit, uh, even, it's not that long ago actually, where you could not find anyone below the age of 20 in a gym. At least not lifting. But now you do. If you quit sports when you're like 14, 15, you enter the gym, the private gym. Um, and that's kind of uh, where NIF, this is a market that NIF kind of competes with, in a sense. So maybe those health benefits need to be uh, even more emphasized because people quit many because they're tired of the competition. I don't want to be a super uh, superstar or uh, I don't want to be a professional football player. I just want to play football for the fun of it. And then the most important aspect she thinks is that NIF must have a plan for including children and youth from different social classes and make sure that sport is not excluding. I think it's interesting that this uh, article was published four or five years ago and now last week they held a, a meeting where this was an issue. This has been known for a long time and then the last couple of months it's been in the media and then something happens. But this is also a very important aspect or a very important thing uh, sport needs to be including, not excluding, in order to it being for all. You can do this on your own. Next lecture uh, will be after, after Easter. We're going to look at, <laughs> I call it the dark sides, the problematic sides of sports. Um, I haven't yet uh, found articles in English, so I will uh, post that on, uh, on Frontier. I will, lay th I will uh, publish them there. Uh, it's, um, yeah, we will probably uh, touch upon uh, doping problems or problems with doping and, um, yeah, corruption, sexual abuse, etc., etc. So, with that, we will just wish you a happy Easter. Be safe in the mountains. No risks. Yeah, I thought for me it was kind of you who was the one who was going to do it.